Good morning. Last time, I had started talking about what fields do when they enter materials. And today, I am going to continue that topic. The first part of the lecture, I am going to talk more about currents and current density. And in the second part, I am going to come back to what I call the dielectric constant. So, two topics. One is current density J. It is a very important topic. It will become far more important once we talk about magnetic field. The second topic will have to do with the uh, with D equals epsilon E. So, the dielectric constant epsilon. Okay, let us go back to the first topic. Some time ago, I had talked about <coughs> why it is that inside a conductor, you cannot have radially diverging currents in steady state. I said that if you made some imaginary surface like a Gaussian surface, current is going out everywhere which means charge is leaking through the surface at every point. At no point is charge entering. And if charge is not entering, but is continuously leaving, it must mean that the charge content inside this contained by the surface must be continuously reducing. So, I was saying that I surface greater than 0 implies that d q d t is less than 0 and this is correct. Now, what I want to do is to make this idea more mathematical, more useful. This is correct as a qualitative statement, but it is not very useful. You cannot put it into an equation and calculate anything. So, let us see what we can do with this idea and make it go further. Another thing that I did was I connected up the presence of the electric field and current. And I said that if you have an electric field and you have a conductivity sigma, the electric field implies current. Now, there is one problem about all these statements, specifically this one. Out here, electric field is a vector, but current is a scalar. You can see that from this relationship, the current is related to d q d t, but from both of these, the, by, by just drawing arrows representing current and by this relationship you can see that you really want a vector quantity called current. You do not want a scalar quantity called current. The current that comes into Ohm's law is a scalar, but the current we want to put into these things is a vector. So, we need to, we need to be more precise in what we mean by current. So, let us look at that problem. Supposing I have some surface, I am going to call it S, and supposing I have electrons, these are all minus charge, and these electrons are flowing. Now, as these electrons flow, some of them pass through the surface and others miss it. So, for example, these two pass through the surface, cutting through it at two points, whereas these two just go away from the surface. So, if I want to know how much current 
pass through this surface, what I need to do? I need to say that I sub s, the current through the surface s, is equal to number of electrons passing through surface per second. That is why it is not a vector, current is a scalar, it has no direction. But how do I calculate this quantity? I have to count up electrons. Well, the electrons will come with a number density. n is a number density of electrons, number of electrons per meter cubed. And at every point, I will have a velocity vector u, which is drift velocity of electrons. So, if I want to know, and this is actually, I have to multiply this by the charge of the electron of course, minus E. So, if I want to know this bracket, I would like to say this bracket is equal to a surface integral over this surface, the number density of electrons at some point on the surface the flow velocity of electrons at that point. So, if I take some region here, there is a number density and there may be a flow velocity. But this flow velocity would not be in the direction normal to the surface. So, just as in Gauss's law, we must take a dot product dot d s. And if I integrate this quantity through the surface, then I would get the number of electrons that pass through the surface per second. Now, is that obvious? Let us look at how I got that statement. Let us say an electron drifts this far in one second. In the next second, it drifted this far. Third second, it drifted this far. Fourth second, it drifted this far fifth second and so on and so forth. Now, it, it penetrated this surface at some time t. Now, I want to know between t and t plus 1 second, how many electrons pass through? Well, what I will do is I will construct a small sphere, small cylinder and make that cylinder 1 second long. What do I mean by 1 second long? As or I will make it actually a distance, its length equal to the flow velocity of the electrons, because in one second electrons move u meters, u is the velocity which is meters per second. So, in one second you move u meters. So, if I take a cylinder which is u meters long and count up all the electrons in it, that corresponds to the number of electrons that will pass through this region. So, this quantity represents number of electrons passing through the small piece d s per second and then I integrate it. So, I s the surface current is minus E times this quantity. Now, let me put it as a proper integral, it is surface integral s of a quantity which is minus e times n times u dot d s. And this is true for any surface I choose. The current through that surface is going to be this square bracket quantity dot d s. Now, if you look at this square bracket, e times n 
is a charge per meter cubed. U is a velocity. So, if you take charge times velocity, this is current. So, this is a current density. It has the dimensions of current density and so, we in fact give it a name. We call this J which is the current density field. Now, what are the properties of this quantity? First of all, if you integrate J over any surface, you get the current through that surface. That is, the I through a surface is equal to surface integral J dot d s. It is a very useful result. It is a way of building up currents for arbitrary shaped surfaces. The second thing that you can see is j is a vector because u is a vector. Now, as you will recall when we discussed earlier, the problem I was coming up against was I was using vector concepts, but using a scalar to define those vector things. Like I said, a vector quantity electric field was inducing a scalar quantity current and I was drawing arrows to represent that current. If I draw arrows, I should draw a vector. If I mean a scalar, I should not draw the arrow. So, the arrows that I have drawn here are really representing current density. Now, if I want to use current density and I want to uh, redefine my earlier statement, here is what it is. I have a conductor and I draw some imaginary surface closed surface, 3 D closed surface and let us say that I have current flowing out. So, what do I mean? Now, I mean surface integral J dot d s is greater than 0, because current flowing out is current through the surface and current through the surface is nothing but integral over that surface j dot d s. Now, current is moving charge and it is one of those very important conserved quantities charge. When Einstein started thinking about relativity in the beginning of the 20th century, he had a choice. He could throw out Newton's laws or he could throw out Maxwell's laws. And what he did, if you look at it, is the following. He had a choice, he could say, he could talk about mass, he could talk about charge, he could talk about length, he could talk about uh, electric magnetic fields, he could talk about time and he thought about it and he said Maxwell's equations are perfectly correct. So, he kept E and B and all the equations about E and B correct. He said charge is perfectly conserved even if you go into a science fiction uh, novel and start moving at the speed of nearly light, Q will still be Q, but mass is not constant, length is not constant, time is not constant. So, the conservation of charge is a very fundamental thing and in modern physics, it is one of the very important conserved quantities. Now, what does that mean? It means that if I had this conserved quantity, so much of it, say 10 coulombs of it inside this surface. Now, because of this current, I can imagine drawing another surface that represents how much of the charge moved out in one second. 
So, all this charge was lost after one second. So, clearly what is left is less, charge is conserved, I have got rid of some charge therefore, I have less charge left. So, if j dot d s is greater than 0, it must imply a d q d t. Now, can I make that more precise? Well, yes I can. This j I have already said is n times minus e the charge times u. This is the rate at which charge is going out. This j times an area is in fact what we are talking about here. Now, this E times n is nothing but charge density. So, I can rewrite this equation as saying surface integral j dot d s, which is the rate at which charge is leaking out is equal to minus d q d t, the rate at which charge is reducing inside, but what is d q d t? It is minus integral over the volume surrounded by s of rho d v. Let me interpret it again, j dot d s is nothing but the charge that is leaking out rho d v is the charge occupied by any small volume inside the d d t sorry, inside any small volume of this uh, surrounded volume. So, if I integrate over all the volume rho d v, I have counted up all the charge inside the surface. So, the charge leaking on the surface must be equal to the amount by which the charge contained is reducing in time. This is called charge conservation. Let me rewrite the equation. Surface integral over and closed surface j dot d s is equal to minus d d t volume integral volume enclosed by that surface rho d v. Now, I know uh, a theorem that converts a surface integral to a volume integral, this is the divergence theorem. So, I can write that this surface integral is also a volume integral over the enclosed volume divergence of j dv. This is Gauss's law. You have seen it before when we derived it for electric field and there we had surface integral over a surface E dot d s was equal to volume integral divergence of E d v, which was equal to charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. It is the same thing, j dot d s instead of E dot d s is equal to divergence j d v instead of divergence E d v. So, divergence j d v over the volume is equal to minus d d t over the same volume rho d v. Now, as you know integral equations are very nice, but we like to make them into differential equations. So, I would like to convert this equation into a differential equation of the type that we have already been using. Let us look at this term. 
it says rate of change negative of the rate of change of charge enclosed. Now, if I have a volume V and I have charge everywhere, so rho of R, the rho is also a function of T. When I integrate this rho over V and I ask what is the change of this integral with time, the way to think of it is let us imagine I have some surface, on that surface I have defined a function. And I want to know how the area of this uh, integral of this function over this area changes in time. Either the area changes in time or the height of the function changes. If I do a double integral here, f dx dy, either the limits change or f changes in time. Now, we are considering a stationary volume because it is an imaginary volume anyway, so we are not moving that volume. So, the only way that this integral can change is if rho depends on t. So, really what I mean is integral over the volume of minus time derivative of rho dv. Now, how do I write that time derivative? You see, I want to know how rho of r t changes in time. So, what do I want? I want rho of r t plus delta t minus rho of r t over delta t. So, when you look at this, you can see that I am keeping r constant. I am not varying r, I am only varying t. So, what goes in here is what we call a partial derivative. So, we went from a total derivative to a partial derivative. That is a very important thing to realize. Outside the integral, this quantity is q enclosed and q enclosed is a function only of time. It does not have a, any dependence on r. All the dependence on r was integrated over. So, you will get 4 coulombs, 4.1 coulombs. You will not get 4.1 coulombs at such and such a place because all the space information has got integrated away. But once you are working inside, this is charge density. I am saying 4 coulombs per meter cubed. I do have to say where as well as when. So, rho is a function of r and t, but only the t derivative is taken. So, this becomes a partial derivative. This is called a total derivative. and this is called a partial derivative which we have already been using. So, to write it all down, here is what we have. We have volume integral, volume enclosed by surface S divergence of j dv is equal to volume integral volume enclosed by surface s minus del rho del t dv. I can combine these two integrals. So, I will just make it one integral. I will say integral over the volume v s of divergence j plus del rho del t dv equals 0. Now, this s that I started with is completely arbitrary. It is an imaginary surface. So, I can choose any surface I like and this is true for all surfaces. Now, when something integrated over an arbitrary surface gives me 0, the answer must be that this is identically 0. 
Why? Because supposing it is a little positive somewhere or a little negative somewhere, I will choose a surface just covering that little positive region and I will get a positive answer or covering just the little negative region and I will get a negative answer. If I get 0 for every possible surface, it can only be that this quantity itself is identically 0. So, divergence j plus del rho del t is identically 0 and this is called uh, current continuity or charge conservation various names, but basically what it means is when charge tends to flow out of a point, the charge at that point tends to decrease saying nothing more than conservation of charge. Now, this is a very useful equation. Let us try and use it in a simple problem. Let us suppose I have a wire and the wire is connected to a resistor. and comes out. So, this is copper, this is copper and this is some resistive material. So, it has a sigma that is much, much lower than copper. Now, this is a little more difficult to solve. So, I am going to pretend that a resistor is not fat. So, I will assume that actually it is a same cross section as the copper wire but it has say some conductivity sigma. A current I is flowing and the cross section here is A. So, the current density J is equal to I over A, but I also have to give it a direction. Let us say that this direction is z, so it is z hat. So, the current density is a vector, it has the units of current per unit area and it has a direction z hat. Now, we had worked out last time, maybe two lectures ago, that if you have an electric field E and you have a you have a current as a result of that electric field, they are related by j equals this sigma times E. This just comes out of applying Newton's laws of motion, it comes out of looking at d V d t times the mass is equal to q times the field minus m nu v. And when you work it all out, you get a relationship between current density and electric field. Okay. So, now we have a relation between J and E, and this has a length L. So, there is a the current is uniform, which means E is uniform, which means the drop in voltage between the point A and B, B A B is equal to integral E dot d L A to B and this integral is nothing but J over sigma dot z dl dz integral from a to b. So, that becomes what I have written here, which is the j itself is i over a, then 1 over sigma times integral a to b dz. a to b dz is nothing but L. 
So, I can replace that by L. So, we have that actually I am sure I have gone ulta somewhere, you will have to help me out. Uh, I would not continue this ex example because it seems to be leading to the upside down answer, but you can see that resistance is coming out of the uh, relationship. So, what you have is J equals sigma E applied to this resistive material and when you work out what the voltage drop from here to here is, you get it is I into a into an expression which gives you the resistance. Now, the resistance must be proportional to L, inversely proportional to A and inversely proportional to sigma. So, we can write R equals L over sigma A. Uh, you can confirm whether I have made any mistakes in the normalizations, but you can see that a concept which talks about current density in a wire naturally gives us Ohm's law and that that is a trivial example, but it is actually telling you what you can do in a more general case. The more general case would be as follows. Supposing I had the lead I had a cylinder of material and then I have a lead going out again. These are copper and out here entering into the resistor and out here leaving the resistor, there is a current density J which is equal to I over A. Inside this material, what do I have? Well, inside the material, I have that electric field times sigma is equal to J, which means divergence of sigma E is equal to divergence of J is equal to minus del rho del T is equal to 0, because I am in steady state. So, no charge is collecting no charges vanishing. So, I have divergence of sigma E is 0, but E itself can be written as minus grad phi. Let us assume that sigma is a constant that is this resistance does not have different types of conductivity at different points, it is just one material. I can pull the sigma out. So, I get divergence of gradient of phi equals 0 or del square phi is 0. This is again the same formula we got earlier when we solved, when we took combined the divergence theorem and grad phi. So, this is nothing but what is called Laplace's equation. Now, Laplace's equation is a differential equation. So, if you want to solve Laplace's equation, it is a second order equation. You can write it out as in Cartesian d square dx squared of phi plus d square dy squared of phi plus d squared dz squared of phi equals 0. So, you can see second derivatives in each of the directions and we know from our theory of differential equations that if you have two derivatives in an equation in any direction, you need two conditions to pin down the answers. So, you need what are called boundary conditions. 
Now, typically if you are doing problems in electrostatics, the boundary conditions are potentials. So, you would like to be able to say the potential is 2 volts here, it is ground here, it is ground there. But there is no such boundary condition here. The boundary condition we have, the only one we have is current being injected is I over A. So, how can we solve this equation? Because this is the equation we have to solve. Well, the, there is a condition and it is a fairly important condition. Supposing we imagined drawing current lines. So, what will happen to the current? There will be current coming which will go straight through, but if you look at current slightly off center, that current is going to go ballooning out. The reason is there is more space, so there is no reason for it to stay right in the middle. It will try to fill up all the volume of this resistor, that is why a fatter resistor has lower resistance, but you will never find current doing this. This is not allowed, that is current cannot leave the resistor, current can fill the resistor, but it must always stay within the resistor. So, what is what is the mathematical way of saying this? Well, the mathematical way of saying this is at the surface, if you look at what the current is, the current must be tangential it cannot have a component like this. For that matter, it cannot have a component like this either, because if it did, then charge would start depleting at this point. So, you have a condition and the condition is that J normal or J dot d s is equal to 0. So, the boundary conditions under which you must solve this equation become as follows. For resistor, del squared phi is equal to 0, j which is equal to sigma e which is equal to minus sigma del phi del n is equal to I over A at leads and J dot d s equals 0 or del phi del n equals 0 at rest of surface. This is the kind of problem that you end up having to solve. It is quite similar to the electrostatics problem, except instead of specifying potential, we are specifying del phi del n. Later on, we will see how to solve such problems. Right now, I just want to formulate the problem. So, you can see that there is a lot of use in being able to write this equation divergence of j is equal to minus del rho del t. And this is the governing equation if you are talking about conductors. Now, the question is what happens if you are working with an insulator? Now, last time I introduced and discussed two problems and both those problems I think need to be kept in mind when we talk about uh, dielectrics. The idea of a dielectric is you have a lot of nuclei and the nuclei have electron clouds around them. Now, the story is different for conductors, for 
semiconductors and for insulators. Here I am going to discuss insulators. Now, what is an insulator? I hope you have done some solid state physics because the answer is going to be given in terms of what we call an energy band diagram. If you look at uh, an atom and you ask what happens in an atom, you know that we have quantum mechanics and because of quantum mechanics we have a ground state, then you have levels, more levels and so on. These levels are the energy states of electrons, possible energy states of electrons. So, the hydrogen atom would have something like this and these are called Lyman, Balmer, Paschen etcetera. The spectra are very famous and they have been studied for centuries. Now, that is the simplest kind of system. When a, when a atom has more than one electron, already this picture gets confused because the electrons start fighting each other and it is no longer this clear Schrodinger equation picture, it is what is called a multi electron system. Each of the electrons inside the atom attempt to get as far away from each other as possible and so these original energy levels that are there in Schrodinger equation get modified, but still you have some energy levels modified, but again what we call line spectra. Once you go to a material, a solid or a liquid material, then what happens is the energy levels in, a, in one atom modify the energy levels of neighboring atoms. So much so, depending on whether the electron here is in this state or in this state, the energy levels of this atom also change. The result is that instead of having these nice clear energy levels, in materials, in solids, you tend to have we only show the last two bands, there are deep bands inside, the, there is a conduction band and a valence band. Now, here is where we distinguish between conductors, semiconductors and insulators. In conductors, the conduction band actually overlaps the valence band, they touch. Because they touch, valence band electrons can jump into conduction band levels and that is how they are able to move. In semiconductors, this gap is very small. It is so small that it is comparable to thermal energy. Once it is comparable, when I say comparable, it is still 10 times larger, then it is weak, it is possible that a very few electrons will be able to jump up to the conduction band and move around. An insulator has a very large band gap. Because it has a very large band gap, electrons never jump to the conduction band. So, the conduction band might as well not be there. So, an insulator is a region where electrons, all electrons in their places in valence bands. There is no room to move, they cannot jug, shift around because there are no gaps. The consequence of that is when I now apply an electric field, the electric field distorts all the electron orbitals. So, it makes the s orbital slightly distorted, it makes the p orbital slightly distorted, the p orbital in the direction of e is becomes higher in energy, the e p orbital opposite in the direction of the e 
becomes less energetic. But whatever orbital the electron happens to be in, it is stuck there, there is no place to move. So, what happens is all the orbitals get distorted a little bit, not just the outermost orbital, the innermost, next to innermost, next to innermost, every orbital gets slightly distorted. However, it is the orbital that is outermost that is the most distorted. The reason is you can draw a potential energy diagram and you can say the electrons have, have filled up, sorry not, not out here, have filled up. So, obviously an electron that is sitting out there has so much, so deep in the potential well, if the electric field came, it does not even notice. This potential energy that the electron may have might be 50 eV and the electric field would represent a very vanishingly small amount of uh, potential energy that it can gain. Whereas, the top energy level it becomes quite aware of the electric, electric field. So, the top uh, energy levels are the ones that get distorted a lot. So, we always consider only the highest part of the valence band when we calculate how the orbitals are changed. This calculation has been done and when it was done, what they found was that in the presence of an electric field, all the orbitals change. So, if you take, if you take an electric field like this and you have a nucleus, the s orbital changes slightly. The earlier p orbital which was like this has now become like this. The earlier p orbital that was like this has now become stretched out. The earlier p orbital that was like this has also got shifted. All the orbitals get shifted a little bit in the opposite direction of the field, so much so if you take them all up, you find there is a net change in the location of the electrons. This net change means that you have a plus and a minus center of mass for the electrons. Now, you can put this as plus n e minus n e and you can put a distance d. That is the n represents the number of electrons present in the atom or you could put it as plus e minus e and put n d. It does not matter. Both ways you will end up with the same answer. So, very often you will use, you will see one or the other way of presenting this. Once you have all this in mind, now what is the consequence? The consequence of having the electric field come on this block as I discussed last time is that you get dipoles induced, this picture. These dipoles in turn partially cancel other dipoles. And so on and so forth till the bottom dipole pair come out. So, the internal dipoles all neutralize, this is only true for a specific geometry of drawn, it is not in general true, but in this case all the dipoles cancel. So, what is left? You are left with a surface charge there is negative surface charge at the point of entry of the electric field, there is positive surface charge at the point of electric field leaving. One way of thinking about this is to say if I have a block, I have electric field coming 
and I have some negative charge, then I have some positive charge. What, what you can imagine is this field line and this field line stop here. Inside, these field lines continue. Outside, all the field lines continue. So, just from looking at this picture, you can imagine what is going to happen is electric field is weak compared to electric field here and electric field here. That in fact is the case because if you draw a pill box, a Gaussian uh, surface, what you get is the entering electric field, this is the leaving electric field. The difference between these two is represented by the charge on the surface. So, E internal minus E external is equal to minus surface charge. So, E internal must be less than E external. Now, let us put down some numbers for this because without numbers we cannot progress and make equations. Supposing I had a block and supposing I had n atoms per meter cubed and let us suppose that only one electron per atom was actually moving because of the electric field and that atom moved, that electron moved by a distance d. So, for any nucleus there was minus e plus E, the rest of the electrons are sitting with the nucleus and a distance d. So, what would happen is the n atoms would not shift, but the electrons would shift by how much? They would shift by a distance d. So, the, the positive is the lower rectangle. and the light colored rectangle is the negative charge. So, this is neutron, this is negative, this is positive. So, how much positive charge would there be? The amount of positive charge that is sigma would be equal to the height times the density n d times the charge minus e. So, the sigma is negative. Similarly, here sigma is n d times e. Now, if you look at the electric field inside, we have just worked out the electric field inside is going to be equal to the electric field outside minus n d e divided by epsilon naught. So, this cancellation can uh, this reduction in the electric field inside the material compared to the electric field outside the material means that analyzing electric fields inside any dielectric material is a little difficult. So, what we do is we look at this expression and if we look at this expression, this quantity d is d is proportional to the external electric field itself because the stronger the external electric field, the more the electrons are going to get pulled apart from the nucleus. So, I can put this as a proportionality. So, I can replace this whole thing and I can say this thing is some, I am not, I am deliberately using the wrong symbol alpha times E external. So, it the internal electric field is actually equal to 1 minus alpha times the external electric field. 
And if I look at the fraction E external over E internal, it is 1 over 1 minus alpha. So, this is like the extent to which cancellation has happened. In a medium which is very easily polarizable, you will find most of the electric field has got cancelled. In a medium that is not easily polarizable, easily in induced charge is not easy to happen, then external and internal electric fields will be merely the same. So, this quantity has something strongly to say about the dielectric constant. And the, I'll continue in the next lecture to pin down precisely what it says, but you can guess that it has to do with the displacement vector d.